my name is John Arelli. I'm really happy to be uh, with you this morning. We are continuing a series that we're doing called Good Faith. And why talk about good faith? Well, sometimes faith can be bad. I've come from all kinds of faith experiences that were just bad for me. Uh, so we're looking forward to good faith and uh, what means to have good faith. Today we're talking specifically about the Holy Spirit. Uh, this morning, I want to tell you a story. It actually involves Greg and Stephanie's pastor from Houston. I was at a conference, a vineyard conference in Galveston, and this conference in Galveston was just a bunch of people from the vineyard movement. There are about 600 churches around the states, another 1,000 around the world. So all these people from the United States, they're all coming to Galveston, Texas for a conference. And the conference is really great. There's great worship. There's great speakers, all kind of great stuff going on. One thing that they do typically at the end of one of these services during the week is they have a time of prayer. People can come forward to get prayed for, and we do that every week here. Uh, after worship, during worship, there'll be people in the back that'll pray for you, and it's, a, it's just a really good opportunity uh, just to receive prayer. So I uh, personally, though, have come from a situation where um, there have been faith experiences that kind of jolted me in the wrong way. For instance, uh, someone prayed for my wife once, but they tried to rock her while they were praying for her to try to like, sort of like manipulate something that was going on, and it really turned her off. And it was that experience, and experiences like that, um, that, that kind of shoot us from experiencing the Holy Spirit in a way that we could just be free. We were always thinking about, sort of anxiously, what else was going on behind the scenes. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, but... For me, I, there was, I, needed, I needed to break through that. So that night, it was one night during the conference, I remember a great worship time, and then they say, you know, if people want to come, pray, come forward for prayer for one thing or another, come forward. And I'm, I'm sitting in my seat, and I'm feeling for my wife as well, because we're both sort of in this situation. We're, we're in it together. We don't want to bend to the hype of whatever's going I don't know. We were just so, our minds were so set against being free to experience the Holy Spirit. I said, no, I'm going to stay in my seat. I'm even telling God, no, God, I'm going to stay in my seat. And they start describing the things that they want people to come forward for if they need prayer. And they describe my life pretty much to a T. And they go, no, Lord, you know, that's just coincidental. Thanks. I'm, no. And they keep describing it. And it's just closer and closer to my heart. What's going on in my life and work? And I'm like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll. But God, you've got to make it obvious that you want me to come down for, for prayer. And I remember this feeling in my stomach. It was like a muscle, like, I, I don't know what happened, but I, I, was, I began to, like, bend over. And it wasn't pain. It was just, uh, why are my muscles clenching all of this? I don't understand what's going on. And I, I go, okay, oh, God, God, are you trying to speak to me? And even more, I just get this feeling of, like, but, like there was, a, for me, a signal, a relational signal from God. This is God's presence on me right now saying, you better go forward right now. And so I am, you know, in the aisle by the, the, the aisles over here. My seat is all the way at the end. I'm feeling like I've got to walk through all these people. At this point, I don't care. I am feeling such a, a tug from the Holy Spirit. I am walking through people. I don't care how rude I am. I'm just plowing through the legs, and they're all worshiping, and I'm like, bet, like pushing them away, and I'm being awfully rude about it, because I feel at that moment, I better get down front. So I get down front. And I... There's a bunch of people down there, and what you're supposed to do is just sort of wait, and someone's going to come around and pray for you. Which, when you have a lot of people praying, there aren't enough people to pray, and so people just kind of go from one to another. That's just what happens. So I'm there, and I'm waiting, and I feel this touch on my shoulder. And the guy starts asking me my name, what's going on in my life, and I say, so I'm a pastor, and I've been working with a lot of single moms right now. They're just, they're wonderful people in our church, but it's just been a big burden on me. And I didn't know what to do. And uh, context clue, my job at the church at that time was to do financial assistance for people. That was to get our, our, our church out into the neighborhood to serve the poor, but also to do financial assistance for those in need, for people in and outside of the church. And so it was just a heavy week that way, and I was just hearing a lot of stories from folks who just had a hard financial time. And I was feeling the burden of it. So I, I told this guy the story. I didn't know who it was, but I just because I'm just... I'm just there, and he's just asking me, he said, all right, well, let's just pray, and began to pray. And it was very simple, just like we prayed this morning, come Holy Spirit. And we just waited. And we waited. 
And I began to feel the presence of God slowly come. And he directed, too, while this was going on. It was, Holy, I could already feel the presence of, of the Holy Spirit on me. And then he directed, he said, God, from the top of his head down to his toes, just fill him up right now. And I began to just be filled. And I began to cry. So, uh, I'm an emotional guy. I'm Italian. So I yell and I cry, and this is just what happens in my life. I'm just a bunch of emotion. That's I use my hands at times to express myself, and uh, but I, I typically wouldn't cry, especially because I was trying to protect myself against whatever emotional experience might be going on apart from the Holy Spirit. I wanted the Holy Spirit, but I didn't want the hype. And what happened was the Holy Spirit came, and what happened was I cried. And so he asked me, so what's God, what's God doing? I said, I don't know, but I just feel his power on me. And so I began to tell him what was going on in my week, and he, he continued to pray. And he said, yeah, John, this is what's going on. He said, there's a, like a bowl that you are filling with tears right now, and I'm sorry to tell you, it's not full yet. Now, that's not the nicest thing to say to somebody. You've got to keep on crying. It's not going to stop. Just want to let you know. But what happened at that moment, I will remember to this day forever, was that it was the first day that I began doing what I did with the Holy Spirit instead of apart from the Holy Spirit. That day, when the Holy Spirit filled me, it was a beginning where I wasn't doing it alone. And everything I did, working with single moms, whatever, wasn't on my own strength, but it was on the strength of the Holy Spirit. Now, out of context, you might say, well, who is the Holy Spirit? Why, why would that be important to you? Well, the Bible thinks that it's important. So let's talk about that exactly where we're talking about. This is 1 Corinthians 14.1. Most people that I talk to in life, religious or non, Christian or non, followers of Jesus or non, they like the word love, and that we should all be loving. Wouldn't you agree? So this is Paul writing to a church, and he says, love is the highest goal. But, love is the highest goal. Wouldn't you agree? Love is the best. In the Bible it says, God is love. But Paul says, love is the highest goal, but also seek the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he goes into this storyline of all that you should be practicing in your church regarding the Holy Spirit. This is Mark 16, 15. This is Jesus. This is Jesus' declaration to his disciples. And then he told them, go out into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety, which is uh, what happens to that guy Paul who we just talked about, his story of faith. He got bitten by a snake, but he was fine. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them but they will be able to place their hands on the sick and they'll be healed. Jesus' declaration for people to go out, what he tells the disciples to do, is not separate from the work of the Holy Spirit. But he says, when you do this, those who believe will act in the power of the Holy Spirit. Pretty cool, huh? So, does it start with Jesus? Jesus? you would think, well, yeah, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. That's where it starts. But no, it's all over the Old Testament. Let's look here. Genesis 1 tells us that the Holy Spirit isn't the force like in Star Wars. For a long time, I just thought the Holy Spirit, well, that just must be the force. Like when you get those uh, Star Wars entities in your blood, what do you call them? Uh, Someone, please, Star Warsy nerd. And no, there are no nerds in our church. Please, Thank you. I thank you. We sometimes think that the Holy Spirit is like that, where we get to now all of a sudden walk through 
a futuristic technological space and push people with our force, and that, that is the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. Check out how the Bible describes the Holy Spirit. In the beginning, God created... This is the first verse in the whole Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. A person of the Trinity. The image that I love of the Trinity the most is of Jesus getting baptized. So Jesus goes to get baptized by John the Baptist. And so there's Jesus. There's one person of the Trinity. And then as he's baptized, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Not in a force, but in, a, in, a, in like an image of a personhood. And then God the Father, person of the Trinity, says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. So, it can be confusing because there are many faiths out there that would say, well, those Christians, they believe in three gods. And it's not true. We believe in one. We believe in one. But we see this activity, this tension of the three. Jonathan Edwards was an evangelist in the 1700s, uh, had revivals all over the place. The 13 colonies were just filled with revivals out of what happened with Jonathan Edwards. This is not Jonathan Edwards from the TV show about magic. Um, Jonathan Edwards does all kind of fun stuff, and he experiences the Holy Spirit, and he talks about the Holy Spirit as if the Holy Spirit was the expression of love between the Father and the Son so powerfully done that that expression became personhood. Something to take into attention. But continue with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. This is Genesis 41. We see the Holy Spirit in people. So Joseph gets enslaved and he gets before the Pharaoh of Egypt. And he gives him suggestions, interprets dreams, does amazing things. And then Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? This is the Pharaoh of Egypt identifying that the Spirit of God is in someone. And this is in the Old Testament. We see the Holy Spirit upon people. This is Judges 3. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Othniel. You're not the only one that gets his biblical names wrong. The son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenaz. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he became Israel's judge. He went to war against King Kushan of Aram, and the Lord gave Othniel victory over him. So there was peace in the land for 40 years. Then Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord fills people in the Old Testament. This is Exodus 31. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I've specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson... Thank you, Jan. Grandson of Hur and the tribe of Judah. I have filled them with the Spirit of God. What I love about this verse is what continues next. The Spirit of God, you think, is just for, like, doing church stuff? But look what what cool stuff God was... This is actually regarding the temple, but... I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and carving wood. He is a master of every craft. Who wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit so he can be the master of every craft? That's cool! I, I think that's great. But there's something about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament that is impermanent. It's not, it seems not to stick with people. Specifically with Saul, there was, it was, it's a little distressing even to read. This is 1 Samuel 10.9. As Saul turned and started to leave, God gave him a new heart. And all Samuel's signs were fulfilled that day. When Saul and his servant arrived at Gibeah, they saw a group of prophets coming towards them. Then the Spirit of God came powerfully upon Saul and he, too, began to prophesy. It's Old Testament. The Spirit of God is on Saul. But then, just six chapters later, 1 Samuel 16, 14, now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. 
And the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. There's a tension there from, I'm like, God, why did you send something to torment Saul? And you see this played out as David then begins to comfort Saul and, and, and then David becomes king. But it was God who placed his Holy Spirit on people and then removed his spirit. I take attention with it, but this is what's happening. So there are drawbacks to the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. It's great in that there seems to be an empowerment from God. God places the Holy Spirit on people. But there's still a sense of distant feeling from people at the same time. A sense that it's not permanent. It doesn't stick. Like something's still not right. David, specifically, was one of these people, if you read any of the Psalms, will say, let me go to your holy temple. It was as if he always wanted to go back. Like he would leave the temple, and he wouldn't be cleansed anymore. He'd want the Holy Spirit again, and he would always want to go back. Like there was a yearning, a hunger in him for this Holy Spirit to be permanent, available. So God talks about this in the Old Testament, about what needs to happen. This is Ezekiel 36. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. And you will live in Israel, the land I gave to your ancestors long ago. You will be my people, and I will be your God. It sets an expectation. Something's got to happen here. Something's got to break, because this isn't enough. It's not enough, God, that you go about putting your spirit on people, take them away. There's something incomplete. You've got to do something. And then to the rest of the Old Testament, you see this hunger, this strain. God, where are you? This desperation in the people for God to rule and reign like he hasn't before. And then all of a sudden, John the Baptist comes on the scene. And John the Baptist says, all right, you guys, you better repent and be baptized because there's someone coming after me that won't baptize with water. He'll baptize with the Holy Spirit. And he's talking about Jesus. Jesus. So John baptizes Jesus, like I told you. Holy Spirit comes. Jesus goes about his work. Jesus has disciples. They go out and do miracles. But he says, I've got to go. And could you bring up that John 16 verse before the Acts verse? This is John 16 talking to his disciples. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I've done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Because I'm going to be, go and be with the Father. Because. I ask a question of myself regarding the Holy Spirit. Is it better that Jesus leaves? It's better that he leaves. Isn't that weird? It's better that Jesus leaves. Because, because, and then the Holy Spirit empowers people, and anyone who believes in Jesus will do the same works that he's done, and even greater works. Think about that. Jesus did some great works. Can you imagine what greater works would be than raising the dead? Even greater works. So Jesus goes, and the disciples wait. They wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. They know the Holy Spirit's going to come. And then in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes on the day that they call Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost in this, uh, King, I think it was King James. And began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. They spoke in tongues. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men and women of, of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, 
I love this translation. It was noise. The Holy Spirit was noised abroad. The multitude came together and they were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. This is people from all over the place. Jerusalem became their center point. Remember Ezekiel said, I'll bring you all together? It became the center point of what was going on at that time. People from every nation were around. And all of a sudden, these people were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were speaking in tongues. And they were speaking in the tongue of the language of all the different nationalities that were coming to Jerusalem at the time. And they all heard it in their own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Shouldn't they just speak a Galilean accent, dialect? But no. They were speaking in everybody else's dialect. And how we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, everywhere they were placed, everywhere they were coming from, Medes and Elamites and dwellers, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, ever all the place, Egypt, Libya, Rome, Greeks, even Greeks heard their own language. Sounds like Greek to me. What does this mean? But then Peter says, this is what this is all about. And he quotes Joel in the Old Testament. You go to this next slide, Jeff. This is what was talked about in Joel, he says. And it will come to pass in these days, like it said in Ezekiel, I'll pour out my spirit upon everyone. All your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. What if the whole culmination of the Bible, what if Jesus, the prophets, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the whole deal, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, which the kids are talking about this morning. What if it all culminated on Pentecost? What if this event where people are finally filled with the Holy Spirit was the most important day of history? What if the Holy Spirit, sounds like to Jesus, is the most important person in the world? I've got to go, Jesus says, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. In fact, he's got to go, it says. What if the central subject of the whole Bible this book that we have that God's given to us, what if the central subject is experiencing the Holy Spirit? I would think we should pay attention. If you look at Billy Graham, Billy Graham's, uh, he was a big evangelist, 60s, 70s, 80s, filled stadiums full of people that wanted to hear about Jesus. He, He counseled presidents and Sometimes it was good, sometimes he was just a man. But one thing about Billy Graham was that before he did any of that, he had this experience where the Holy Spirit filled him. Any important person in good faith, in history, if you read their biography, starts out with this important moment with the Holy Spirit, where they experience the Holy Spirit. Over the next week, next week we'll talk about what that means if the Holy Spirit comes and what the Holy Spirit does in good faith. Today we're just talking about who is the Holy Spirit. I love who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit comes to empower, give gifts. The Holy Spirit sends us out on mission for the kingdom of God. The whole purpose of why Jesus had the Holy Spirit come was for us to join in with what God's doing on the earth. Anyone who believes in me, said Jesus. So every week we take this time where we get around the cup and the bread 
and we take Jesus' body and his blood in mystical symbolism. We don't understand exactly what's going on there, why Jesus has us do this to remember him, but we do it. Every Sunday we do this for a couple reasons. One, to remember that Jesus is central to it all. Two, to remember that we get to take Jesus in. The mission of this church is <laughs> to invite Jesus into all of life. To welcome our community. To invite Jesus into all of life. To invite our community to welcome Jesus into all of life. I get those words screwed up sometimes. So we do this every week because we want to do that. We want to make Jesus central. But we also give an opportunity for people who have never done it before to do it. So I would just encourage you, Michael and Jan are going to come. They're going to read a verse from 1 Corinthians before they offer this cup and this bread to you. That if you've never made Jesus center of your life, it's going to be really hard to experience the Holy Spirit. Not that the Holy Spirit's not going to pursue you. (laughs) I've seen the Holy Spirit pursue people this week out of prison and all kinds of stuff. It's been, I've heard some stories this week, even before they've said yes to Jesus. But I would encourage you, if you want to experience the Holy Spirit, if you want God to do amazing things in your life, to accept Jesus. To say, Jesus, I want to make you Lord of my life. I don't want anything else to be Lord of my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to come into my life I want you to forgive my sin, forgive my separation from you, forgive anything I've ever done to separate from you or anybody else. And I want you to be Lord of my life. That prayer is so important. And we just sometimes we just don't get it. Why is that prayer so important? Because it's a declaration. This is where I want my life to go. And good faith is all about that. The Holy Spirit is so important to good faith. I want us all to receive the Holy Spirit. So next week we'll talk about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And then that evening, would would you make a pre-made decision to go? I know it's at night, it's different. Would you make a pre-made decision to go at 6 p.m. next Sunday? To hear about what it means to experience the Holy Spirit and then to just practice. It's nothing, again, I don't like hype. But we're going to practice what it means to experience the Holy Spirit. Would you just make a pre-made decision to go? I'm going to ask Jan and Michael to come again. If this is your first time to say yes to Jesus, would you use this time where you take him in? And then would you receive prayer? Because there are some steps forward that would be really helpful for you. I'd encourage you to go that way. Thanks, guys. Thank you for your willingness. God, for your presence throughout the ages. Thank you for your Holy Spirit as a gift to us. Thank you, Lord. Would you just uh, reach out your hands if you'd like a blessing? I bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to go out full of the Holy Spirit. We sang this morning about breaking chains of prisoners and serving the poor. God, would you send this congregation out to do just that, to be a part of your kingdom, but full of the Holy Spirit, God. Not full of themselves or their own strength, God, but would you just fill them up, God. They'd be filled with you. Holy Spirit, would you send them out to do your work, your kingdom work. Your kingdom come, your will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. We just thank you, Lord, for your presence, and we ask for more. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace and finish the bagels and donuts and coffee. And uh, again, make it a pre-made decision to come next week. We'd love to see you.